Ben Haele Banim. Uh, gives us a little uh, wordplay, actually, from the passage below there, Luke chapter 3, verses 2 through 9. And those are the, uh, those are the verses that we're going to be looking at. Actually, one verse in particular, uh, verse 8. And um, that wasn't a title, though. But let's uh, go ahead and read the passage here first. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to Yohanan, uh, John, uh, John the, the Immerser, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he came into the region around the Jordan, proclaiming an immersion of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And he said to the multitudes who were going out to be immersed by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance, and do not say within yourselves, Abraham, he is our father. For I say to you that God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And I'm sure many of you have read this passage probably many times. And, um, and as I mentioned, uh, verse 8, that's the one we're going to really focus on today. But the passage continues, and also the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear f good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So we're back here to our key verse uh, in verse 8, and I can see... Um, I'm still getting used to the PowerPoint here, so I can see the yellow isn't really working there, is it? <laughs> but it's Luke chapter 3, verse 8, and that's our key passage there. And especially, Abraham is our father, for I say to you, God is able from these stones to raise up children, sons, to Abraham. After this, and we're not going to read the passages after this, but Yohanan actually gives instructions in terms of what does it mean to come before the Lord in repentance, and what are the works of repentance. And you'll remember that to the tax collectors, he says, don't take more than actually the Romans had instructed you to take from the people. And, and also to the soldiers, he said, you know, don't forcibly take anything from people. You know, be, be fair to the people. And, uh, and, and so, you know, again, it's, it's focused on how do we treat other people? How do we treat people with love? How do we treat people with justice? And that's, that's a big part of, of our repentance. In other words, it's not just, you know, repentance isn't just a turning of our heart, but it needs to result in action as well. So, so far we have an undisclosed title for this passage. And I wanted to give you some options. I was just thinking about, you know, and actually, as I was looking through some commentaries, kind of getting some ideas, you know, what were, what were people focusing on in this passage? Bearing fruits of repentance. That would be a good message from this, right? Flee from wrath, brood of vipers. You know, if I was in an angry mood, that's probably what I would do. <laughs> How to make stones into sons. Actually, that's going to tie in a little bit with what we talk about. Replaced by stones, oy vey. <laughs> Actually, that kind of gets into some, uh, uh, some shaky theology there too. And then circumcision of the heart. Anybody get that from the passage? Anybody? Yeah, one person, very good. You, you get the prize <laughs> all by yourself. That's going to be our title, Circumcision of the Heart. And we'll see how we get that out of this passage. First of all, to get there, though, we have to look at some foundational concepts, and they're going to be in the form of questions. Seven questions to get to that point. First of all, how is the Luke passage commonly interpreted? And we won't spend a lot of time with that. What is the purpose and the origin of circumcision? That's important to know in our discussion. What is meant by Avraham, he is our father? That's an important concept as well. Number four, why are the religious leaders treated harshly? You know, why does Yohanan come down on the religious leaders so, so hard? Why did Yeshua come down on the religious leaders so hard? It's an important question here. Number five, what is meant by circumcision of the heart? So we'll get to the heart of the matter in number five. 
Number six, what stones are being re referenced by Yochanan? Very uh, interesting question there. And how do we sign up for the circumcision of the heart? I would say that it's a little bit easier than signing up for the physical circumcision, but in reality, that's not necessarily true about our, our walk with the Lord. So, Q1, question one, common interpretations here. One of, uh, a common interpretation would be the trees destroyed by fire are the unrepentant. The stones that become sons of Abraham are regenerated in Messiah, including now the Gentile believers. Actually, that's not so bad, right? But we'll, we'll take a look at that a little bit uh, more. Some commentaries, like I said, get into some shaky theology, replacement theology. Some theologies will argue that Israel is permanent re permanently replaced some will argue that just temporarily replaced. And then some will focus on what I would say a friendly inclusion of the non-Jewish people or the, or the Gentiles into the community of Messiah. But in the time of Yohanan, the Gentile believers weren't yet on the radar. They weren't really the focus yet. And, and later, later they will be. Yochanan, the immerser's focus. Well, first of all, the passage itself references a passage from Isaiah. And so Yochanan's ministry is what? It is to prepare Israel for the coming of the Messiah. The ministry of repentance is to prepare Israel for receiving the Messiah and for the kingdom of God to be reestablished in Israel. What was uh, Yeshua's? Yeshua's focus also was to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, almost exclusively in his ministry. But of course, you know, we know uh, by reading on, because we've kind of seen the end of the, of the story, or certainly the continuation, that eventually Peter has the vision in Acts chapter 10, and finally they get the message, oh, the message of Yeshua needs to go out to the non-Jewish people as well. And then, of course, Paul, his ministry uh, really expands the ministry to the non-Jewish people as well and to the non-Jewish world. But for now, you know, we're, we're back to Yohanan's ministry. And, and just as a way of, of affirming that it is so important that the gospel, the good news of Yeshua, did and has and continues to go out to the non-Jewish people from Isaiah chapter 49 verse 6 it was always understood but that wasn't the focus of Yohanan's ministry in Isaiah 49 he says it is too small a thing that you should be my servant the Messiah speaking of the Messiah to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel in other words it's too small a thing that you would only do that I will also make you a light of the nations, the Gentiles, so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So we have that established, right? And, uh, and yet, the Gentile believers, not yet on John's radar. I, I just put a little diagram here together to illustrate how things seem to appear today. You know, when we talk about the, the church, we talk about Israel, and, and you know, there's, there's no intersecting there, is there? I used um, a Hebrew terms and, and, and a Greek term over here, kehilat Israel. Kehilat is one of the terms uh, that's used for an assembly or congregation or community of Israel, and it's used throughout the, the, uh, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures. Ekklesia is the Greek word from which we get the term church. The interesting thing, though, is that ecclesia, the term, existed even before the time of Yeshua. In fact, that was the word that was used often to translate actually two Hebrew words, eda and kahal, or from which we get kehilat and adat. So kehilat uh, Yisrael, adat Yisrael. You know, those were translated into Greek with the word ecclesia. And so it's not a new word. And yet, you know, we, you know, we, we this, is, this is kind of the state of things in today's world. 
And yet, in the early community of Messiah, how did they view themselves? How did the, especially the, the earliest Jewish believers, how did they view themselves? Here we have the, the big circle representing Kehilat or Adat Yisrael, the, the community of Israel. And then we have Kehilat Adat HaMashiach. We have the community or the ecclesia or the church of the Messiah. And they never saw themselves as leaving the community of Israel, did they? Now, I'm not going to go any further with that. I'm not including the non-Jewish people in there because they do fit into that, that, that circle there. But the theology gets more controversial and, and complicated, so we're not going to go there. But enough to say, though, that the, the believers, they weren't looking you know, at their belief in Yeshua as something that would take them away from Israel. It was something that, we, you know, the hope was that that circle would expand and cover all of Adat or Kehilat Israel. By the way, the, the smaller circle there could just as easily be Kehilat Ben David, which is the name of this congregation, right? Because Ben David refers to the Messiah. Question two, the purpose and the origin of circumcision. This will be a review for most of you. We go back to Genesis chapter 17, verse 11, when the Lord is commanding Abraham, the Lord to Abraham, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant, the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. Thus shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. So first of all, the covenant of circumcision the, the circumcision is a sign. It's a sign of, of the covenant relationship between Abraham and God and his descendants, all of his descendants of promise. So in other words, the promise only went to Isaac, the promise in the next generation only went to Jacob, and then it finally went to all the sons of Jacob, the children of Israel. But I also reference... Uh, and something that, that uh, Doug has talked about in, in his study leading up to Joshua, the, the generation that was born in the wilderness, they weren't circumcised. And so it, it became a kind of a sign of punishment and shame that they were in the wilderness for 40 years. They weren't going into the promised land. It was promised to them. It was part of the promise made to Abraham. And because of sin, they weren't able to go in. And so not being circumcised was a sign of shame. And we see that at the beginning of Joshua because it said when they were, when they were circumcised at Gilgal that it removed the reproach or the shame that was upon them when they were finally circumcised again, the, at least the generation not circumcised in the wilderness. And so, you know, it's, it's a sign of spiritual restoration as well. And that kind of leads us to the subject of circumcision of the heart. Because remember, the generation that went into the wilderness, they were circumcised, but not necessarily circumcised in the heart. And that has always been important to the Lord. So in, in the first century, we have a, a similar situation. The people that were coming to Yohanan, they were Jewish. Even the soldiers, even the tax collectors, they were Jewish soldiers, so, uh, Jewish tax collectors. The uh, Pharisees were out there, probably the Essenes, even though they're not named uh, or mentioned by name. You know, many people were coming out uh, to see Yohanan and to be uh, immersed for repentance. But, this, but the situation in the first century was they needed repentance. They needed that not only to be physical sons of, of, of Abraham, because the males were circumcised, but the heart as well. So we're on to question three, the meaning of Abraham. He is our father. Do not say within yourselves, Abraham is our father. That's what, that's what John was saying to the people. Well, why not? The people that came out to him were circumcised. Why couldn't they say that they were sons of Abraham? Well, because there was a deeper meaning to what he was saying. To be a son, to be a true son, and, and they were using this way. Uh, we actually see this in many of the dialogue uh, in the gospel accounts. But to be a son, to really be a son of Abraham was to be a disciple 
or a Talmud. And so there was a teacher-student relationship. And as a Talmud, to be a student of a, of a teacher was to be a learner. It was to learn from that teacher, but also, just as importantly, to emulate the behavior of that teacher, to become like that teacher. Here's an example in a dialogue between, uh, between Yeshua and some of the uh, Judeans. And in chapter 8, verse 39 of, of the Gospel of John, they, the Judeans, answered and said to him, Yeshua, Abraham is our father. And Yeshua said to him, to them, if you are sons of Abraham, do the deeds of Abraham. And so we see that concept there. To be a Talmud, to be a true son, is to actually do the things that your teacher is teaching you and to be like them. And then back in, in verse 31, Yeshua was saying to those Judeans who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples or Talmudim of mine. So our goal, our ultimate teacher really is Yeshua himself. And he's the one that we truly want to emulate and to be like. Amen? You guys are awfully quiet, so I just wanted to make sure. We can go even a step further here. In John, this is uh, 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 actually 1 John, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. See how great a love the Father has given to us that we should be called children or sons of God. And so we are. Beloved, even now we are children of God or sons of God. And, and you know, what does that mean? That the concept there is we are to become like God, not, not in all of his glory, of course, but to take on the attributes of God, to learn from him. And, of course, we have the example of Yeshua very clearly in the Scriptures. Beloved, even now we are children of God, and it is not yet apparent what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. Do you see the concept there? To be a son of God is to eventually be like him. For now, we're just learning, right? We're learners. We're, we're, we're working on it. Sometimes not so successfully, right? So what, you know, John, he doesn't say you will be children of God. He says you are. So what did we do to earn that title? What's that? Believe, have faith. Follow all of those things. Cultivate it. Absolutely, all of these things. But what did we, but, but again, did we really earn it? You know, that's, and, and I have, <laughs> I hope Doug doesn't mind this, but I coined this a Rabbi Dougism, and it's, and it's one of my favorites. He, he has said this several times, and it always catches my ear. He says, the Lord calls us to come as we are, right? That's not the end of it, though, right? He calls us to come as we are, but... Okay, but how does Doug say it? <laughs> he, the Lord calls us to come as we are, but not to stay as we were. But not to stay as we were, right? But to come as we are because God, in our repentance and in our turning to Him, He will accept us. And through His grace and through the righteousness that Yeshua has provided for us, He accepts us as sons as we are. But, of course, it doesn't mean that we stay as we were, right? There's, there's more to follow. But that's the good news. The good news is that he accepts us as we are. It's not something that, you know, we don't have to work on our piousness. We don't have to educate ourselves, get a degree in, in theology. We don't have to do any of that in order to be accepted by the Lord. We have to receive God's righteousness through Yeshua. 
and he accepts us as we are in all of our frailties, in all of our, in all of our imperfections. He accepts us. That's, that's our good news. Question four, why such harsh warnings for the leaders? You know, the leaders, well, let's look at this. Going back to, this is something that the Lord communicated to Isaac, but it relates to Abraham. God says to Isaac, he says, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and I will give your seed all these lands. And in your seed, the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my safeguards, my commandments, my decrees, and my teachings. Now, Abraham's a good example, too, because God accepted him as he was, but he didn't stay as he was, right? And, and so Abraham, in, in his walk of faith and faithfulness, he was obedient to the Lord. And that's what we're to learn as well. Well, the leadership in the first century took this. Many of the Pharisees and the Essenes, they considered themselves true sons of Abraham, as we saw in the dialogue with Yeshua. Due, but but in, in this sense, partly due to their superior knowledge and their meticulous observance of the Torah and the traditions. And so, again, the, the leadership, they were, you know, and they were looking, they weren't looking at God accepting them as they are so much as what they had become. And they kind of had it backwards. And because of that, they weren't bringing the people along. And that's what the leaders were to do. The leaders were responsible for teaching the word to the people, to bringing the people along. But instead, they were starting to look down upon the people. As a matter of fact, this term, Am Haaretz, you know, to look down on the, the people of Israel. Am Haaretz is the people of the land. And it, was, and it was a term that wasn't really very flattering. It was basically looking at, you know, the, the general population of Israel as not so educated, not really understanding the Torah so much, not being as observant as they should be. That's not a good place for a teacher to be, to start looking down on the very people that they should be teaching and, and bringing to the Lord. And so that was part of the, the, the issue there with the leadership and why Yohanan and Yeshua came down so harshly on the leadership. There's an interesting passage here that, that Yeshua said. He said, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in the seat of Moses, therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. Now, this is like the antithesis of being a teacher and a teacher Talmud relationship, right? Don't you just do what I say, but not what I do. No, as a Talmud, you're supposed to take on the character of your teacher. You're supposed to emulate them. You're supposed to be like them. That's, that's your goal, or even to exceed uh, where they're at. The antithesis of that teacher Talmud relationship. It's an, it brings us to, well, without getting too far into this, there is a double meaning to the word Pharisee. You know, Pharisee kind of indicates a separateness, you know, that they separated themselves from those things that would make them unclean and, and so forth. But really, the Pharisees, they had favor with the people. You know, and the, and the Torah, in a sense, is, is, it is a form of democracy because a judge isn't appointed as a judge or a teacher, isn't appointed as a teacher unless they have favor with the people. That's, that's what the Torah teaches. And so the Pharisees, they did have favor with the people. The Sadducees did not. And yet, the term Pharisee also, on the other side, meant a hypocrite. And it wasn't just the opponents of the Pharisees that used that word to mean hypocrite, it was Pharisees criticizing other Pharisees and using the term hypocrite. We see that in the Talmud, for instance, when we, very similar to Yeshua's seven woes of the Pharisees, you have the, uh, virtually the same thing in the Talmud as well. Pharisees criticizing Pharisees for being hypocritical. And so it's kind of an ironic way of looking at the term Pharisee, but it was used. It was used, um, it was used in the Talmud. It was used in the, in the Gospels as well, in the, in the Brit Hadashah. 
The recognition of authority is not a validation of teachings. That's very important in understanding this passage. Yeshua was saying the Pharisees have that authority, but recognizing their authority is not the same as validating their teachings. So he wasn't saying, as, as we, I, you can see this all over the internet, by the way, you know, many people say, look, you know, Yeshua validated the, the Pharisees. We should be learning from them and following what they say. But no, not always. You know, Yeshua had many disagreements with the Pharisees. The Brit Hadashah has many disagreements, you know, with some of the common teachings of the Pharisees. You can't just say, well, because they believed it and Yeshua said they had authority, we need to, to incorporate that. No, it's not a validation. In fact, he says just the opposite, really. What is the circumcision of the heart then? And we go to Deuteronomy, two, two passages from Deuteronomy. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. So that means don't be stiff-necked. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul in order that you may live. And we see that passage and it says... The circumcised heart is one that loves the Lord with all of our heart and all of our soul. It gives us a little bit of a, a hint in terms of what circumcision means. But by the way, the first question should be, who is it that circumcises the heart? Kind of indicates two different views there, doesn't it? He commands us to circumcise our hearts, but then it says the Lord God, He will circumcise our hearts. And really... It is a work of the Lord. It is a work of the Ruach HaKodesh in our lives to circumcise our hearts, but we have to want it first. We have to seek it first, and that's our job. If we're going to circumcise the foreskins of our heart, we have to seek the Lord, and we have to rely on Him to be the one who transforms us. The second bullet item, relationship to physical circumcision. That's really important in understanding the concept of circumcision of the heart. The physical circumcision was a sign of the covenant, the covenant relationship. And in a covenant relationship, the Lord has responsibilities, we have responsibilities, and that circumcision was a sign of that covenant that we have with the Lord. The circumcision of the heart, it's not just enough to be a physical, again, a physical descendant of Abraham. The idea is that we would we would, in our hearts, we would have a heart for that covenant relationship with, that we have with the Lord. That's something for us as well. You know, are we happy just to know that we're a believer? Are we happy serving the Lord? How, how many of you serve, without raising your hand, how many of you serve the Lord with joy? How many of you serve the Lord with passion? How many of you seek the Lord's counsel in your life and do the things, you know, that, that He calls us to do with joy and with passion? You know, that is evidence of circumcision of the heart. And the importance to Yochanan, the immerser. That's the point that he was trying to bring Israel to in the first century, to emphasize that it's not enough just to be a physical descendant of Abraham, that we need to be inwardly a descendant of Abraham as well, circumcised in the heart. Question six, what stones were John, uh, John is referring to which stones and avanim banim, that, that word play there, by the way. Avanim means stones. Banim means sons. And it's, uh, again, if we take the Greek text and we put it back into Hebrew, we see actually all kinds of word plays uh, in, in the passage there. This is one of them right here. Stones to sons. Now, the, it, it's only because the words sound the same. But it's a common connection there. You can see it in the Hebrew, even if you don't read Hebrew, you can see the, um, the colored text there in the Hebrew. Ha, ha'avanim, stones, the last letters there are exactly the same as banim. 
for sons. And so you see a, a kind of a sound-alike wordplay there. God is able from these stones. He seems to be pointing to very specific stones, doesn't he? And so this is one way that we could just kind of get around the rest of the message here. Um, I reference, you know, those of you who are disappointed if you didn't hear Doug today, you, there's still a chance. You can go to the Ben David website, and there are sermons there. You can listen to Doug the rest of uh, Shabbat if you'd like. But there was one particular message, and, you know, Carol and I, my wife, we were talking about this uh, yesterday, and I said, you know, uh, Doug's message about the memorial stones in Joshua, Joshua chapter 4, you know, you know, how long ago do you think that was? And, and she, you know, my, my wife said the same thing that I was thinking just a few weeks ago. It was a few months ago, September 10th. It just shows how memorable your, your sermons are. <laughs> I really, I, I thought, guys, this was just a f few weeks ago. So, um, but, but, but there's some, uh, uh, you know, th that was the point at which uh, Doug was talking about the memor memorial stones uh, that were brought from the Jordan River. And there's some interesting discussion there, and I encourage you just to, to go to the website and, and listen to that, and listen to some of the discussion about the stones. There's actually some controversy, too, in, in the uh, understanding of the stones. But part of the controversy was, was there one set of stones or two set of stones? Now, first of all, for those of you who may not have, have heard uh, uh, the sermon, even though I encourage you to, to go listen to it today, when Israel crossed the Jordan River, remember God parted the Jordan River, and while the Ark of the Covenant, with, you know, the priests had the Ark of the Covenant in the middle of the Jordan, takes the, you know, God instructs Joshua, choose a person from each of the tribes to take a stone and to carry it out, to carry it out from the Jordan River. Okay, so there's 12 stones, and eventually those stones are taken to Gilgal, and the people there are circumcised. So there, now we're seeing a little connection there between the Jordan River, which was where, and this is where Yohanan was immersing, by the way, in the Jordan River, in that area, that region of the Jordan River. So, so the stones were taken to, to Gilgal, and, but then there's one verse, and Doug talks about this in the message, there's one verse that, that seems to indicate that that they were told to go, you know, to take stones from dry land and put them back into the Jordan. So there were 12 stones that were taken to Gilgal and then 12 stones that were taken from dry land and put into the middle of the Jordan as a memorial. So two memorials, right? Except, you know, Doug uh, discussed the fact that nah, it may just be one. It, you, know, it, it, you know, it's very important in, in how we read that. And it's only one verse that refers to. But... Um, but I have to, well, I agree. I, 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 I tend to agree with, with Doug. I don't think you were dogmatic about it, but you leaned towards one set of stones, which I think is, is probably correct as well. But, but, the, but the fact is, the rabbis were split on this. Some believe that there were two sets of stones. Some believe that there were one. So we don't have to decide who was right but the interesting thing is that there were traditional teachings on this that both pointed to a spiritual circumcision or a circumcision of the heart. In other words, those who believed that there were one set of stones, those who believed that there were two, they each had teachings, and they were slightly different, but they both pointed to the importance of circumcision of the heart and why it's so obvious that Yohanan was talking about that as well. Just really briefly, those who believed in one set of stones, the stones were taken to Gilgal, and that's where they were circumcised. And the traditional teaching, well, one traditional teaching is that the, that the knives, which are described as stone knives that were used for the circumcision, were actually made from the memorial stones. Okay, so that if that's true, if that was Yohanan's understanding, what he was saying was, from these stones, God is able to make sons of Abraham. He wasn't saying that the stones would be transformed. He was saying that God would take, spiritually speaking, metaphorically speaking, he would make 
these flint knives, these stone knives, from the memorial stones and circumcise the Am Haaretz in the heart. You know, that God is, it, but the important thing is that God would transform the Am Haaretz as they were. So in that case, it wasn't the stones that were being transformed into sons of Abraham. It was that this, the, metaphorically, the knives were taken from the memorial stones. However, those who believed that there were two sets of stones saw it a little bit differently. The stones that were taken from the Jordan River, they tended to be smooth because that's the way stones get when they're in a river, right? Over a period of time, they become smooth. So the smooth stones that were taken to Gilgal are representative of circumcision, smooth stones. But then the 12 stones that were taken from dry land, which were not smooth, and then put into the Jordan River, they're like the Amharats. They're not so smooth. And so they, don't, they represent the need for a spiritual circumcision. And so uh, either way you look at it, either interpretation, it points to the need for our spiritual circumcision. And that, all of that to say, Yochanan understood this. When he said these stones, God is able to make from these stones sons of Abraham. He was saying to the leadership, you're, you're looking down on all the Am Haaretz who are coming for, for repentance, but God is able to transform their hearts. He's able to take them as they were. So, how, how do we sign up for this spiritual heart surgery, as we could call it? First, do we admit our need for transformation? Not everybody that came to Yohanan admitted even the need for transformation. Are we willing to be changed and to turn to Yeshua? So it's not enough just to see that, yeah, I, I really need to repent. I, I've known a lot of people in my life who recognize their need to change but aren't willing to come to the Lord and they're not willing to come to Yeshua. Are we coming to the Lord as we are? Or are we striving first to be pious or to be cleaned up before we come to the Lord? It's so important. We have to come as we are. Because, you know, God, He's the surgeon. He's the one that wants to work in our hearts. Are we passionate about this? Or are we resentful or lukewarm? That kind of goes to not staying as we were being passionate because that's the result of the circumcision of the heart. Are we passionate about learning and emulating? Do we want to be sons of Abraham? Do we want to be sons of Yeshua, of God? You're awfully quiet. Do you want to be sons of God? <laughs> What's that? I know, yeah. <laughs> Are there issues in our lives that need addressing? If there are, and there are, if we really look honestly at our hearts, there are always issues. Schedule surgery. You know, circumcision of the heart is not just a one-time surgery. You know, we're to remain circumcised in our hearts, and sometimes we have to return to that concept. So some key points here. The stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Right? going back to, to Joshua. In Yohanan and Yeshua's time, the stones still represent all of Israel, not just the learned and the pious Pharisees and Essenes. Remember the discussion that they had with Yeshua. We're sons of Abraham. You know, we're, you know, we're disciples of Abraham, right? You know, what are you talking about? We, you know, what need are you talking about in our lives? All Israel, scholars and Am Haaretz are in need of repentance and transformation, circumcision of the heart. That's the great equalizer. We all have the same need. Israel is the focus, not the nations. Gentiles are included through Messiah, one body, one community, and the lessons are the same for all of us. That wasn't on Yohanan's radar at the moment, but that was always part of God's plan for all of us to learn from these lessons, for all of us to be circumcised in the heart, male and female, Jewish or not Jewish, circumcised in the heart. 
We are sons of God through repentance, acceptance of Yeshua, and that circumcision of the heart. And what I mean by sons of God, we are disciples of God, and, and God owns us. We, we, we are in relationship with Him. Emulate Messiah. And again, the Rabbi Dougism, I don't know if that term's going to stick. We are called to come as we are, but... Not to stay as you were. From these stones, sons. Would you like to close this? Because I can go up there. <laughs> Somebody is listening to my sermons. <laughs> I was very impressed. I was a little worried when he said a rabbi. Oh my gosh, which one is this? <laughs> Come as, everybody heard of, as a, you know, I, when I grew up, I heard of something called a come as you are party. Anybody remember that? Remember that term? It meant we're having a party, don't get dressed up. These days you get dressed down. No, no, you just, whatever you're wearing, just come on over. You got your bathrobe on, come on over. Right, that was a come as you are party. You come exactly as you are. That's the whole idea, you know, you call them and say, hey, it's come as you are party, come right, in, what, but I, I just got out of the shower. I got my bath. <laughs> Come as you are, but don't stay as you were. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for the reminder that we are in desperate need of you. Lord, that you are the one who transforms. You are the one who will enable us, enable us, Lord, to affect this world, to be an example as we should be to those around us. Father, we, we all fall short, and we know we do. We see that sometimes, that's all we see. It seems like, it seems like we, we fail so often. But you are such a merciful and faithful God. And you lift us up. And because of you, Lord, because of what you have done and continue to do in our lives, everyone here, says thank you and everyone here says Lord help us to be transformed again anew even further that we may honor you in a greater way than we have ever honored you before and we thank you Lord thank you that you you're constantly willing to, to do that for us may we when we leave this place today May we feel transformed and look to you for continuing that transformation in our lives and all God's people.